So I have to start right off with a disclaimer that this photo is obviously a little bit old because my hair is a little shorter. In fact, we just yesterday had our ISO audit and the auditor, the first thing she says to me is, so what's new since the last time we met? And I said, well, I went from a number two to a number one. <laughs> and she proceeded to say, well, you know what? My husband wanted to do that, and I think it's the worst looking hairstyle ever. And I told him I'd divorce him if he did that. <laughs> so I thought to myself, well, this audit couldn't start any worse than that. <laughs> so it can only go uphill from here. So uh, it was, no, but it, it turned out to be a good audit, and she, I think she realized what she had said afterwards and felt a little bit bad about it. So it actually played in my favor because she was then trying to be nice. So um, you know, just quickly, uh, I'm with a company called EDSI. So many of you know who we are. Some of you don't. Uh, we've been around for almost 40 years. Uh, we run public workforce development programs, and we have a large consulting group where we do workforce consulting, and we also do management consulting. Uh, and I've been the managing partner for that group for eight years, uh, but spent a lot of my career in the manufacturing sector, started my career at General Motors. Do we have any GM people in here? All right. Started at GM, ended up at a company called Flint Inc., which is a $3 billion specialty chemical company, as a VP of manufacturing, and then had the good fortune to run their international uh, business unit and run some of their domestic business units. So I kind of come to you from a general management perspective. And I think that perspective in a lot of ways is kind of healthy when I'm talking to some folks that actually care about what matters, and that is talent. So um, let's, uh, let's jump into this. Um, somebody told me on the way in that I was lucky to have hair like this because it's good for convertibles, and it's good if you go out in that rain because it won't get messed up. So, um, so today we're going to talk about a few things, right? Really, the concept is growing your own talent. But I want to talk a little bit about the situation today. Where are we today? And I'm sure you can all feel the pain of what you're dealing with in terms of trying to find talent, trying to retain talent, and trying really to develop the talent that you need. Uh, so we'll talk through that a bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit who we think will win. Uh, this is not going to be academic. You know, I thought, um, for example, Aaron was awesome. I mean, he had some great stuff. Our information is going to be more related to research that we've done, but more than that, it's going to be a lot of our experience working with hundreds and hundreds of companies. And what we see in terms of best practices, and also what we see oftentimes in terms of worst practices. And I always tell people a lot of times you learn more from the mistakes that you see or that you commit than you do the good stuff. So I, I'm hoping that there's some, some value to you folks in that. We'll talk about attraction, retention, uh, because you've got to start with good raw material, right? Um, and then we'll talk about growing the talent and developing it. I'm going to have a few poll questions in here. I don't know if you guys are like me, you, you might be a little ADD. So please have your phone out and be ready, because I think I've got like six or seven questions probably in the first 10 minutes here. So. Um, and also, I don't know if anybody watches The Voice, you know, Blake Shelton's always sipping on something and we always think that there might be alcohol in there. I did make a quick run out and there's a little bit of vodka in there, so if I fall over, you'll know why. Um, so the first question I have for the group, does everybody have their app up and running? Okay. First question is, how many open positions, full-time positions, do you think there are in the United States today? Go ahead and answer the question. So there's 130 million jobs, full-time jobs, in America. And today, there are 5.8 million open full-time positions, which is the largest number that there's ever been since records have been kept. Uh, so many of you are right. Some of you actually overestimated. I believe that those that overestimated were probably correct, because there are many jobs that don't show up in the stats. For example, in the construction industry, there are a ton of open positions that never get posted for. Um, we have clients that have plenty of open positions, and they're not even posting for them because they know they're not going to find them. So it, you, we used to talk about those people that stopped looking for one reason or another. They stopped looking for a job. Now we see the opposite, which is companies that have stopped looking because they know they're not going to find the talent they need. 
So to put this into perspective, 5.8 million jobs. Imagine General Motors, right? We're all from, I'm presuming we're all from Southeast Michigan or somewhere nearby. Um, GM has 215,000 employees in North America. You know, it's quite a few people. So that would populate, those open positions would populate GM 27 times. If you look at Walmart, which is the largest employer in America, they have 1.4 million employees. Think about Walmart, they're kind of all over the place. Does anybody here shop at Walmart? Nobody's gonna admit it? Okay, right? Tons of Walmarts, imagine 4.1 Walmarts for everyone today. It'd be like McDonald's everywhere. And then imagine that they're all completely empty because they didn't have any employees not only in their stores, but in their retail, I'm sorry, in their uh, distribution channels, in their headquarters, et cetera. Um, these are massive numbers. I think uh, I did the math, and if you took every major league ballpark in America for baseball, it's 1.2 million people. So imagine all of those stadiums full or empty, and then multiply that times four. That's how many open jobs there are. So it's, it's a critical issue. And to compound things, we've got over four million people retiring every year in this country. So um, when I actually was putting this presentation together, I got to this picture and uh, I kind of got stuck for a while because I'm looking at the water and I'm thinking, oh, that looks really good. And then I went into this Jamaican thing, which you're going to see a little bit later on, so forgive me. Uh, so the reality is also there's nine million people based on the, the best statistics we have, um, that are looking for jobs. So what gives? We've got 5.8 million full-time positions that we're trying to fill. We've got 9 million people looking. We've got 4 million plus retiring every year. The reality is this. What you're looking for is typically not out there. All right? You know that. I know that. And what we find is the skills and a lot of times the interests don't match what the requirements are that you have. So here's poll question number two. For your company or your organization, what percentage of your company's positions are currently open? You may have to do a little math. You can do that with your phone if you have a calculator on it. Go ahead and answer that, please. Wow. So almost 40% have over 5% of their positions open, which is incredible. Just a little bit of detail behind this. There are certain industries where it's worse than others. Um, if you look at this list, this is the number of openings based on percentage of jobs in these industries. Construction is number one. Uh, I know that we have a large manufacturing um, Membership within ASE. Uh, manufacturing is one of the top five. It's number four. Uh, and then if you just look at the top six in terms of total numbers of open positions, healthcare, um, professional business and services, uh, hotel and restaurant, retail. Retail would actually jump right to the top of the list if the jobs were all full time, but retail just has a ton of part time positions. But you talk to anybody in the retail industry and they will tell you they cannot find people. They can't find supervisors, they can't find clerks. It's crazy. And then they will also tell you, well, we can't hire anybody that's not 18. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're doing that create problems for ourselves. So let me ask you this. Which category of openings do you have the most of in your organization? And I forgot to mention, um, it used to be our clients would tell us, boy, we can't find skilled trades. We can't find engineers. We can't find higher level uh, management. And now what we're hearing is all of that and more. We can't find semi-skilled. We can't find entry level. We can't find people that'll show up every day on time. It's unbelievable. It's all levels of the organization um, where we're hearing this. So for you, uh, individually, where are your companies? Which type of position is the most critical where you have the most openings?
I love this technology. It's great. But it's so slow. Look at that. I think if we would have done this, certainly back in the recession, um, the entry level, I would have hoped, would have been near zero. But this is just unbelievable. 30% now can't even find entry level folks. So um, when you think about it, you're frustrated. Anybody that's in the space of HR or talent management or whatever you want to call your profession, what is your frustration level on a 1 to 10 scale? I'll tell you what mine is in terms of dealing with this issue. Um, but I want to hear up oh, that's we changed the scale to 1 to 5. Oh, they only gave us five options. It used to say one to ten, sorry. So give, give me a score here. Um, we've just recently done a couple of internal searches for some positions, and I frankly gave up. Um, and extremely frustrated, 40% of you. There's only 2% saying not frustrated. God bless you. That's awesome. Um, but 69% are four or five. Um, and that, I will tell you, is really common. Uh, I see it with our clients all the time. I mean, they're just struggling. And many of them aren't changing their behaviors in light of that issue. So the reality is um, we're looking for talent that doesn't exist. Or it's simply not available, right? It's just really hard to find. So I want to talk a little bit about just keeping talent. Let's talk about today's situation and retention. So this data, I, I, I used some manufacturing data. I apologize, this is a couple years old, um, because I knew we would have a number of manufacturing companies here, and I wanted to use one example. Um, what we saw is you know, we had the recession, right? Turnover, uh, involuntary turnover was a little bit higher. Um, and then what we saw was turnover in general began to decline. And then we started to see in 2012, the voluntary turnover started to go up. And some of the rough statistics that I'm seeing for last year uh, would indicate that in manufacturing, it's more like 14% now. So um, I, don't, I don't have consistent sources of data, and I don't ever trust them if they're different sources, but it is going up. You probably all feel it. And in every industry, we're feeling it. Uh, we just did a, uh, we were just looking at some child care uh, industry data, and the turnover rate is 30%. So imagine that. And the average cost of turnover. Um, I think I, it's funny because I've seen a lot of studies here, and I think these statistics are actually low. Um, it, for people with salaries of under $30,000, we're looking at a 16% of their annual salary is the cost of turnover for that one position. That goes to 25.5%. If you look at those salaries that are thirty to fifty thousand, and executive positions vary dramatically, but go up to two hundred thirteen percent, which is crazy. Um, we just uh, had a discussion with a company that has twenty six hundred employees, and their turnover rate is sixty eight percent, which is crazy, right? Which is why they called us, right? But um, the reality is, when we did the math on it, it's costing them. $5.7 million a year. It's a good reason to maybe spend some time and money and fix the problem. So most of us think about turnover in a certain way, and we, we try to quantify it, right? What is it really costing our organization? Well, the reality is there's the stuff that we always think about. We think about advertising. We think about recruiting, interviewing, onboarding, training. And then there's the learning curve, right? That person comes on board. and. What are they costing you in terms of productivity and everything else? What we see when we're working in the trenches with our clients is a lot more than that. We see um, overtime, for example, uh, in manufacturing environments, overtime goes up dramatically. If two people in a 10-person department are gone, who's going to make up those extra 80 hours a week? Everybody else. And it's all going to be done at premium time. Um, we see quality. We see stress. Uh, we see on-time delivery. We see customer satisfaction issues. Um, and I'm going to give you a different example later on uh, where we've, we're now actually seeing companies that are failing because of lack of talent management. 
they're literally failing, which I've done turnaround work as a part of my career for many years. We never saw that. I gotta be honest with you, never did we see companies just fail because of talent issues. I mean, talent at the executive level because they make bonehead decisions, yes. But talent throughout the organization, no. It's a reality now. So what are the drivers for retention? You know, we see turnover going up. Are we really focused on the drivers? And today's drivers are this. And there's a lot of talk about the millennials, right? So a lot of this um, is kind of impacted by the millennials because all of their data now is flowing into what we're seeing. But this applies to the Gen Xers, the Gen Y, the millennials, the baby boomers. These are the big ones right now. Um, you can look at multiple studies and you're gonna see the same things keep popping up over and over and over again. Good hiring processes, obviously. You wanna hire the right people to begin with, right? Um, you gotta make sure that you've got a good fit for your culture and for the job, et cetera. Perceived value of work has gone up and up and up in terms of its importance for retention. Um, it's not, you may not have the greatest social cause in the world for your company, but you need to begin to connect the value of every job to either social or what it means to that company. Hey, you know, Bob, you are doing quality inspection on these rivets that are going down this line. You know, it may not seem like a whole lot, but you know, if you tie it out for them and say, do you realize half of these go into breaks? And if these rivets fail, breaks fail. And if breaks fail, bad things can happen, right? So it's important. We don't, under, we don't often think that, especially younger employees, don't make that connection, and they need to have that connection. So we need to make that for them. Work-life balance. I love this. You know, it's such a big thing. Everybody talks about the millennials. Oh, they don't want to work hard, blah, 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 blah. We have some millennials that are unbelievable, that work extremely hard. I think especially baby boomers, of which I am one. You know, everybody used to say, I remember being younger, and we would work 60, 70 hours a week, and it was crazy, right? And I talk to a lot of boomers now, and they will tell you, you know, as we've hit 50, 55, 60, we have a different perspective on life, and they're valuing time more than money. So even the boomers are really craving more balance. We're seeing that. We're seeing it through the whole workforce. So it's not just a millennial thing. Positive differentiation. People want to work for a company that can differentiate itself in some way. You know, well, who would you rather work for, Rolex or Timex? You know, I think a lot of people would say, well, I work for Rolex, you know, they're the finest timepieces you can buy and they're expensive and, you know, all of that. And Timex, well, yeah, you get one for $30 at Kmart and you bang it around for a while till it breaks and you get another one. Um, people like to work for a company that is, ha has differentiated itself. Oops, I went too soon. The boss, the retention boss factor, right? Who do you work for? Raise your hand here if you've ever worked for a bad boss. Oh, did you like it? All right, you may not want to answer this question, but do you still work for a bad boss? Raise your hands. Uh, no. Michelle, you better not raise your hand. So the reality is people quit bosses. I mean, it just is. We all hate that, right? You spend way too much of your life. I actually worked, and I won't say the company. I worked for a company when we actually realized that the CEO, who was my boss, um, had a serious drug addiction problem. And it was unbelievable as we kind of figured out what was going on because things were going off the rails. And uh, everybody left. I mean, there was like a year where everybody left. I mean, all of the, the key executives. So people quit their bosses. I remember quitting on my dad one time. I grew up in a family business. <laughs> and he was... I can't say he was a bad boss. He was actually a great mentor, but he, um, I always thought he was much tougher on me and my siblings than he was on the other employees. And, you know, I was a young kid. I'm stupid. I'm 15 or whatever. And one day I'm like, that's it. I quit. This is BS. And I'm out, right? And, uh, and that night, of course, dad comes home and Jim and dad are having a little discussion in the family room, um, which I'm like, oh, this is not going to be good. And the reality was, he was pretty calm about it. And he's like, look, Jim, 
you know, I have to hold you and your brothers and sisters to a higher standard. Because if I don't, right, you're not setting the example for the other employees. If I make things easier for you, then what does that say to every other employee? If they're not a family member, then they're second class citizens. And he was exactly right. So, but people do quit when bosses tick them off, when they're bad. Career opportunities. That's the thing we hear about millennials that I do think is probably more prevalent with the millennial mindset than anything else. Need to know those career opportunities, spell them out for me, please. And, oh, I hope that I'm the CEO in 12 months. <laughs> it is kind of funny. Um, they do want to get there quickly. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So let's talk about growing talent. I'm going to use a couple of examples here. I want to talk about apprenticeships for a minute. Um, if you think and you look at the stats for apprenticeships, they have been declining for decades now. And just if you look since the, the millennium, or the, 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 since 2000, um, they've been declining. The number of programs have declined. The number of active apprentices has declined. And the number of completers has declined, which is really probably the most important number. How many people are completing apprenticeship programs? So it's, it's pretty dismal, right? Ah, but, but wait. There's a different story. In the last, really, 24 months, the data is shifting. We've hit an inflection point, for example, with apprenticeship programs. The number of apprentices is starting to grow. And what this is a signal is this. It's telling us that some companies are starting to figure it out. They're starting to figure out that, you know what, I can't just recruit like crazy and find people. I can't find the people with the talent I need, so what I need to do is build and grow the talent that I need. And comp good companies are figuring that out. There's great HR departments out there that are doing a poor job because they're not getting the CEO or the executive support they need to invest in programs like this. Okay? But it's happening. We've hit that inflection point. Companies are beginning to understand it. Look at this. More data. Um, active apprentices growing in the last two years. Active programs are starting to come back. So here's the, just a question for you. Poll question. Get your phone ready. Fire that thing up. Does your company have one or more active apprenticeship programs? And oh, by the way, you don't have to be in manufacturing of any sort of item to have an apprenticeship program. That's pretty good that 45% of you do. I like that. Um, but unfortunately, still 56% of us don't. And it's a commitment. It's a commitment to developing talent that that's an indication of. We still have way too many business owners and leaders that haven't made that commitment. So, let's look at a couple of other um, indications of what's going on in terms of growing talent. I said, well, let's just look at um, uh, training dollars. It's just kind of a general metric. And training, we always think, to some extent, is a discretionary spend. Well, all right, so let's look at it since 2010. Pretty flat. 2014, that point of inflection that we started to see, started to kind of go up. Last year, 2015, it went up 14.2%. Uh, this is, these are billions, and this is, U.S. data, right? So all of a sudden, companies are realizing, oh man, we need to invest to develop our people. One of the stats that we saw was outside training, outside services, has went up 29% last year. This guy's got a headache, look at him. <laughs> Looks a little bit like Mike Babcock, doesn't he? Um, so, uh, outside or other training costs, such as travel, et cetera, have more than doubled. So what that tells me is that everybody's going, oh my God, we don't have the internal capability to train these people. We're sending them wherever we got to send them to train them. So there's a lot, of, a lot going on here, and we always boil it down to people are looking for unicorns. We're trying to find this magical unicorn that doesn't exist. We met with some folks the other day, and they called them purple squirrels, which I thought was pretty good. Um, so, but the reality is, you know, we're all guilty of it. We're all looking for that perfect person, and they might be out there, but finding them is going to be like find, finding a needle in a haystack. And oh, by the way, 
they're already employed by somebody else, so it's gonna cost you a lot of money to get them. Um, there's something missing on this, so it didn't come out quite right, but that bottom line, see the number of employees and the line above it, the average across sizes, that's, those are the average training budgets for companies of small, medium, and large sizes. So you can see the average large company of over 10,000 employees has a, a training budget of 12.8 million, mid-size 1.4 million, and small 350K. So the average on a per employee basis is $512 of training budget per person. Here's the question that I've got for you. What, where do you fit here? Do you not have a training budget? Are you less than 500 per employee? You might need your calculator to do this again. Um, are you between five and 600? Are you in that kind of average range? Or are you more than 600 per employee? Good. So it's a mixed bag. Um, you guys are obviously, you wouldn't be here if you weren't making sure training and some of the talent management processes get um, the attention they deserve. Uh, typically when I'm talking to people, I would bet if I went out and sampled my clients, I would be shocked if 50% of them actually had a, a designated training budget. So this group's pretty good because we've only got 16% without a training budget and 21% that are below. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the future then. So if we're thinking about today, and we're just trying to guess what's going to happen, there are a few things that we know for sure, right? There is an absolute um, retirement-driven loss of critical skills and knowledge. The boomers are retiring, and they're taking with them tons of knowledge and capability. You know, in the first decade of the new millennium, um, workers between the ages of 55 and 64 increased by 52%, the total number in that age bracket, which is crazy. So the, that bulge of the population is now aging into that retirement or near retirement age bracket. So we know we're going to lose a whole bunch of folks. Um, here's the new one. Companies that lose the talent war may fail. We worked with a company out in Howell just recently. Uh, it was a turnaround. And when we got to the root cause of the turnaround, they had lost their two largest customers. Both of them automotive companies. I won't name anybody because I don't want to incriminate uh, my client. But the bottom line is this. What happened is they have very high turnover. They do plastic injection molding and they do assemblies with the plastic injection molded parts that go to the interior of cars. Well, they're losing all these people and especially in the assembly area, they're losing people. And what would happen is now they're just bringing in warm bodies and they're throwing them at the assembly lines. And these people, A, are not very efficient so the, the cost goes up just on the direct labor. But the next thing is they're slow, so they start to fall behind schedule. And what happens? Well, all of a sudden they're missing shipments, which any of you that's in or has been in the automotive industry, missing a shipment or missing a deadline is a really, really bad thing because you don't want to shut down an assembly plant. But more importantly than all of that is they started having quality problems because they, they hired all these folks they didn't train them properly. They didn't give them time to go up the learning curve. And they started making mistakes. And with both of their large customers, they were quarantined. You know, and it all went downhill from there. They ended up losing both of them. And now they are a severe financial, uh, uh, or they were in a severe financial crisis. We're seeing more and more of that all over the place. And I will tell you, in years of doing turnaround work, I never saw that. I never saw those issues drive a company to near bankruptcy. It's happening now. The talent war, I think, is escalating now to the next level. Um, so the competition for talent is just going to continue to heat up. You know, it's crazy if we think it's just going to magically get better. It's not. Now, many of us say, and even some of the folks that I work very closely with will say, well, you know, but we're due for our next recession. And, and they're right. You know, we are due for the next recession. The next one probably won't be as bad as the, hopefully will not be as bad as the last one. But the reality is this. It'll take a little bit of steam out of the pot, but it's not going to take all the steam out. This issue is going to stay 
And then when the economy recovers again, it's going to be even worse. So you look at successful companies, to me, when I look at them, um, they make talent ma management a key strategic element of their company. It's got to be. Um, you know, it's funny because when I left my old company, Flint Inc., um, we, had, we were sold, and I ended up leaving when we were sold, but um, we had just gotten to the point where we were struggling because we had a lot of PhD chemists and a lot of really technical folks and a lot of engineers and that type of thing. And we finally had determined that, you know, we got to pull our head out of the sand because talent is really, really important to us, and we're starting to struggle with it. And so we took our HR director, and first of all, we promoted him and gave him a, a much cooler title, Chief Talent Officer. And this is 15 years ago, so this is pretty progressive for that time. And then we had him come into all of our executive meetings and our strategic planning meetings. And that was the beginning of what I could see in my company of we've got to make talent a priority here. So who's going to win in the future? Well, I believe it's going to be this. It's going to be the companies that really make talent development and management a core competency. You know, many companies might be really competent at selling or manufacturing or providing a certain type of service. You better also have a core competency in developing your talent. Go back, many, go back into the 50s and you saw a lot of big companies that were very, very competent at developing talent through apprenticeship programs, through training programs, whatever it might be. Those all kind of disappeared. The big companies drove it. You know, the perfect example was General Motors. When I was a GM, I, I was a supervisor on the floor. That's how I started. And we had apprentices everywhere. And then it got to the point where, you know, we had, we're a publicly traded company and we kind of got to keep getting you know, higher stock price, we gotta keep the shareholders happy. So what do you do? You start to cut some of those programs, and we were the big dog, so we would steal the, the talent then from the tier twos and the tier threes. Right? We'd just steal them. That's what we did in my plant. The problem was, ultimately, we robbed ourselves of that capability of developing that talent. And sadly, then the tier twos and tier three companies we're looking around going, I'm not going to put any money into this because GM's just going to steal them from me. Sorry to knock GM. I'm not knocking them. I love GM. I'm not with them anymore. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Oh, good for you. Um, so you're one of those darn baby boomers taking all the talent away. Well, what can I say? <laughs> you look too young to be retired. Um, so aside from this, the companies that make talent management and development a priority, right, they're, they're going to do some other things. Some of the uh, attributes that, that we think are going to be there are, one, they're going to connect their company to a purpose. You have to do that. It's becoming a, a, a must-have going forward. Okay. Growth opportunities. Getting the good, young, talented folks, they need to understand what is that career path? How are they going to grow? How much money can they make? What can they do differently? How are they going to learn? How are they going to make more of a difference as they progress in their career? They want a desirable culture. Frankly, who doesn't? Who doesn't want to work where the culture is good? That's not just a millennial thing. That's all of us, right? And, you know, I go back 30 years ago and I think, I don't remember too many awards for culture and great places to work. And now they're all over the place, right? They're all over the place. So companies are bragging, our company, I mean, we're constantly trying to get awards for a great place to work. And we get them, and it's awesome, because as we compete to try to get these awards, it makes us better all the time. Because we look at certain things, we go, oh, boy, we just did a survey of all of our employees, and we're getting knocked on this. We gotta fix that. And the cool thing about it now is, after a number of years, is what I'm seeing is, people are coming to us. I bet there's not a day that goes by where I don't get a resume emailed to me because somebody wants to work for our company. And it's all because we're getting good press for the great place to work thing. Um, flexibility. Flexibility is huge, not only with the younger workers. Who else is it important to? Working parents. Working parents. Working parents. It's important to a lot of folks, and increasingly so 
to older workers. So one of the things that we always encourage people is to create flexibility programs. You know, uh, gosh, I've got Bob who's going to turn 62 and he's going to retire. Geez, Bob, what if I you know, create a, a, a program where you can be in Florida for three months a year? Or you know, let's create, I love that, I love the reaction, because yes, we all want to be in Florida three months a year. Seriously, think about it. Create some flexibility in your environment because it can help you retaining older workers. It can help you retaining everybody else. Something to think about. Those, we believe, are going to be some of the key attributes of those companies that really win this talent war going forward. So let's talk about attraction because, as I said at the beginning, you got to start with good raw material. And attraction is a critical element of this whole process, right? Um, you got to build a culture. You got to figure out what that culture is going to be. There isn't a perfect culture out there. People have said, well, what kind of culture should I build? I'm like, I don't know. Build a good one, right? Build one that works for you and your, your team. Build one that you think people will enjoy that will also help you be competitive in your, your space. But then measure and support it, okay? You got to measure it. I've seen way too many companies say, this is going to be our culture and we're going to promote it. And all they do is talk about it, but they don't really change anything. So you have to measure and support and then promote it. I have a client that's an awesome client. Um, they are just some of the best people that I've ever worked with. And they're like this hidden jewel because they can't get people. And I'm like, do you guys, you need to be going after some of these awards. You need to promote your point of difference to employees. This needs to be on your website. It needs to be on your landing page, on your home page, so people see we're a great company to work for, and here's why. Here's some testimonials from people. You need to promote your company, your culture, and why you're a good place to work. A lot of us don't do that. We're sort of bashful to promote our culture, or in some cases, we don't want to promote it because it stinks, right? But um, the other thing, and this is something that I learned the hard way. Um, Back in, 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 in my prior company, hiring people for fit was not something we did. You know, for cultural fit, we did not really do. We hired people for knowledge, for connections, et cetera, et cetera. That only gets you so far because you get a couple of folks that are really bad cultural fits and it's cultural poison. So make sure that the, the cultural fit is part of what you're looking at. So there's a bunch of stuff here. I'm just going to touch on a few quickies. Referral systems. Raise your hand if you have a referral system for employees to refer other employees. Okay. There was a time when everybody had them. Again, you guys are more progressive because you're sitting in this room right now. I would bet if we averaged every company in Michigan, my guess is maybe 20% of them have referral systems. You got to have one. You know who the good people are. Right? Um, internships. How many of you actively use internships? All right. So here was the big thing a while ago. Everybody's like, well, we better start using internships to bring in this talent. But then they didn't want to pay for them. So they're doing unpaid internships. Come on. If you want to get the best talent, you know, I look at these kids that are in college today that, that, that are the kids that are getting good grades, that are diligent, that are organized, the ones that everybody wants to hire, right? They have six or seven internship offers for 20 bucks an hour. And you're going to offer one for free? Or do they work for you for free? I don't think so. So the other piece of internships that we see failing on a regular basis is it's not structured. Give them a meaningful job when they're there. If they come in and they sit at a desk and they're making copies the whole time, are they going to want to come back and work for you? Mm -mm. Uh, one other thing, and I mentioned this before. Market your company. Market your culture. Start to think about it that way. You don't just market your products and your services. You have to market your culture. I, when I came out of graduate school, I was at um, Deloitte Consulting for five years. And I will tell you, all of today, it used to be the big eight, all of the big four today are really good at marketing their culture to people. Um, and because they market it, they measure it, and because they're doing all of that, they're actually constantly getting better in terms of the culture they provide for all of their employees. Retention. Keeping the employees you have. You work so hard to get them. You work so hard to develop them, yet 
the average turnover in the United States is 16.4%. And time and time again, you look at really good companies that perform really well in their sector. Costco, for example, 5% turnover. Cisco, 7% turnover. General Mills, 3% turnover. You know, look at General Mills. What, are, what does General Mills do? Cereal. Biggest product is cereal, right? Cereal bars. What do they do? They have plants. They're manufacturing stuff, and they have super low turnover. They, their plants smell great, so they got that going for them. <laughs> so I took one example. Um, there's a lot of data out there, and this is, just, this is just one example. This one's a little bit older. I apologize. Um, I couldn't find their most recent benchmarking study. Um, and it just said, so metal forming, right? I wanted to pick a dirty industry, something that's kind of like, ah, you know, metal stamping. Yeah, this is great. We fabricate, we weld, we stamp. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be loud. It's going to be dangerous. It's going to suck when you work here. <laughs> so I, I wanted to kind of get a handle on, okay, what kind of turnover would, would we expect? And if you look at the green bars, those are the industry average for, um, for metal fabricating. And then the best in class are averaging around 4% turnover. So what it tells me is it doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you establish the right culture and the right processes and everything else, you can have low turnover whether you're Google or whether you're Allison Stamping. You know, it doesn't matter. You can, you can have great people, low turnover, and great retention regardless of the industry you're in. But here's what's even more important than that. This is the same study. They peeled it back. There were over 1,000 companies, by the way, that participated in this. And then they said, well, is there a difference in turnover and profitability? And so what's, what's kind of cool about this data set right now is if you look at the, the red bars, those are the companies that were in the 10% least profitable. And the blue bars are the 10% most profitable. And the height of the bar is turnover. So you can see the companies that were most profitable in 2007, before the recession, were, had dramatically lower turnover. Now, during the recession, even the good companies were jettisoning, jettisoning people, right? But as soon as things started to normalize in 2010, you see it go right back. So by 2011, we're looking at 20% turnover for the, the poor performers. We're looking at 9% turnover for the good performers. You know, so I saw that and I was startled when I first saw that graph. And I'm like, but it makes total sense. Turnover costs you a huge amount of money. And I think as HR professionals, we need to make sure constantly that the, the executive team in your company knows how costly turnover is to your organization. So, <coughs> controllable reasons employees quit. Just want to touch on these. Just so you know in the appendix, and by the way, uh, do we have the flash drives here? Okay. Uh, at our booth, we got a bunch of the flash drives. Grab some. It's got this presentation, but in the back there's an appendix, and there's recommendations for each one of these. I'm going to just touch on a few real quick. I already talked about the boss, right? Um, workload, work life balance issues and flexibility. It's not just for millennials anymore. It's for everybody. Um, financial and job content opportunities. Can I grow? Can I learn more? That's huge in terms of the retention. We talked about that earlier. What are those retention drivers? And then that meaningfulness and contribution to your organization. Brad's here. Brad has, runs a large nonprofit. So you have a natural you know, hopefully for you and all of your employees, it's obvious the benefit that you provide. That's not always the case for many of the other organizations out there. Uh, whoops. Oops, I don't want to get to Bob Marley just yet. Um, one other thing. How, raise your hand if you use exit interviews. How many of your exit interviews are face-to-face? -face? Keep your hand up. How often do you analyze every interview? Do you, do you exit interview 100% of the people that leave? Okay, good. You guys are good. You guys are good. The reality is exit interviews are huge. It's a starting point, but you have to do them right, and you have to do more than just do the interview. You have to analyze the data, 
it's like continuous improvement, right? And then you have to go fix the problem. It might be that you have a supervisor that is really nasty to work for, and in their department, they have super high turnover levels. They either need to be trained, moved to a different role, or booted out of the organization, right? So get to the root cause of the turnover. Exit interviews, to me, again, I bet 50% of the companies that we work with use them, and I bet only 10% of them actually use them the way they're intended to be used. And I bet only 2 or 3% are really good at going back and addressing the root cause issues of turnover. All right. Grow your own mom. <laughs> so when I saw the beach earlier, I'm like, oh, I got to work Jamaica into this thing somehow. And then it was like, grow your own. And I started thinking of Bob Marley. And then I started thinking about marijuana. And I'm like, that's, wait a minute. <laughs> that's not right. Uh, so. I don't know why I went down that path, but I did. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, grow your own. I just love that picture of Bob Marley. My, one of my roommates in college had the tapestry of Bob Marley on his wall, and it was like, he's just such a cool looking guy. Um, oh, there he is again. So, <laughs> hey, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about growing your own talent here. <laughs> so, Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about, um, in terms of talent development, re start simply, right? Have a strategy and an implementation plan. And make sure, just at a minimum, you've got three key pieces. What's your attraction strategy and plan? A lot of people don't actually talk about what is our strategy to attract people. And they don't get buy-in to how are we going to make sure that we have this strategy in place. What's our ret retention strategy? Do we have retention bonuses? You know, are we working on, a, do we do pulse surveys and regular surveys with our employees to understand where they're at and what we can get better at as an organization? And then the last thing, um, specific development capabilities uh, and actions so that you can grow your talent. Again, remember that example of we used to have all these apprenticeships all over the place and we've lost those capabilities, we've lost those skill sets. We need to rebuild them. Okay? That needs to be part of our culture. It needs to be part of our core uh, in companies. Also in, in, in talent development, two core things that I, I see so many companies forget to do. Let's clearly define what are the different career paths that people can have in your company. You know, we were just talking to a company a little while ago, and their turnover is crazy um, in a manufacturing setting for entry-level people. And the problem is, you know, when you started to understand what was going on, these guys are all going in there and they're like, it's hot in here, it's loud, it's kind of dangerous, it's dirty and the people treat me like crap. Um, why would I want to stay here? And they think, well, you know, gosh, you know, if you stay for six months, you can be in the union and you're going to make 20 bucks an hour. Well, most of the people that left didn't even understand what it took to, to get to six months to get into the union, to get that 20 bucks an hour. So we have to define those career paths for people, right? That's an issue in the childcare business. You get so many young women coming out of college, because it's 98% young ladies that have teaching degrees. And they don't understand in a lot of these companies that, hey, you know what? There's actually a, a career progression if I get tired of changing diapers on infants. So we have to make sure people understand that. But more importantly then, within each career path, we've got to have defined ladders. What are the steps that you can move up in this organization? If you don't have a college degree, here's the stuff you can do in manufacturing. Here are the steps. If you have a college degree, here are some of the steps you can take. And oh, by the way, at each rung on the ladder, we have developed training to help you succeed at the next level. Is it guaranteed you're going to get to the next rung? No. But if you work hard, you do a great job, you know, and you, you, you have all these opportunities in front of you. When people don't know that the opportunities exist, that's a killer for retention and development. So another thing, corporate universities. I love to hear that corporate universities are kind of coming back. Companies are developing their own infrastructure to track and to train people and to make sure they're getting the right training for their, that it's job and company and culture specific. So let's build those, right? 
mentoring programs. Um, it was interesting because I saw this quote from Oprah, and it, 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 she basically says, look, I think networking and mentors are important, uh, and I don't think anybody makes it in the world without some form of network or mentorship. Nobody makes it alone. Nobody has made it alone. And look at her. You always think she's just like done so amazing and she's such an amazing person. But she's had mentors. She's had people that have helped her out along the way. I think about my own career. I had two very specific mentors that helped me progress throughout my career. And when I start to talk to people, there's, when you really ask people where they are in their career, especially if they've been in a profession for a period of time and they've had some success, there's always one or two or three people that have mentored them. And mentors are huge in terms of helping people succeed and avoid too many of the costly mistakes that derail people's careers. So think about it. And you know what? What's kind of cool, too, is there's so many workers that have been around for a while that actually like to share. Now, there are some that are horrible mentors, right? But there are others that are great and that actually like it and that kind of really it makes them energized that they can help young people. You know, I, I look at my kids. They're all in their 20s. If I was mentoring a 23-year-old kid out of college right now, I would love it. I'd be like, hey, this is my daughter or my son, and I want to make sure they succeed. Um, job sculpting. Um, we call it career sculpting in our organization. Um, really, it's, it's such a great tool to take people and to really understand what talents do they have and what are their interests and really try to marry those and put them into the right job. When people are energized, when people are good at something, it usually means they like it, right? They're generally kind of interested in it. Um, and when you, get, when you really get people in the right seats on the bus, I know it's cliche, right? Go back to good to great. Um, and all of the, the commentary about the right people in the right seats, et cetera, it's so true. I can't, I, I've, I've yet to find somebody that's had significant experience running a business that doesn't agree with that. So job sculpting is a great way to do that. And it shows, especially your younger workers, that you care about them. It shows them if you promote this, that you do this in your organization, that's exciting. That's going to help you with retention. Here's the one that kills me the most. <laughs> You know, I, I had a few other sayings for what this is, where their heads were, but um, I thought their heads in the sand would be a more politically correct way to say this. But the reality is this. Too often, the whole talent management function is kind of a, a that's just it. It's a function, and it's over here on the side. I believe it's the most important function there is right now, and it's going to get even more important. And that leaders that don't get it have no idea how critical it is to the profitability and growth and long-term health of their company. Um, so that leadership buy-in, I encourage you to start sharing statistics about how expensive turnover is and how expensive it is and what it really does. Do your own research on your own industry if there's any turnover and profitability-related data. Because I guarantee you, you're going to start to see some pretty incredible ROIs in terms of what you need to do for training and investing and some of the things that we're talking about for development. So a couple of wrap-up points. And then we'll go to some Q&A. I, I had three sons, so I never had posters of unicorns. <laughs> um, but I found this one, and I'm like, yeah, if I had a daughter, I'd probably put that on her door. And I love that picture, and of course it's got the do not. It's got the stop looking for unicorn sign on it. Um, it was pretty cool because the one that I was looking at was twinkling and stuff, and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Probably would have been good for Bob Marley. Um, you know. um, so stop looking for unicorns. They're not out there. Um, you got to grow your own. You got to build your own is really what it is. You got to make your own uh, because you're not going to find them out there. And a few next steps. I always tell people, uh, we used to take our sales team to events every six months, right? We'd go off site, we'd do a bunch of training, and we'd have probably 120 of us, and we'd be sitting around, and it was always, 
you know, make sure when you walk out of here you pick up one or two things that you can take back to your office, take back to your job, and really implement. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about are there one or two things that you maybe heard today or in the last hour that you can take back and you can put to use. So the first thing that I recommend is do everything you can to convert your HR leader's role into a strategic role. And then let's have some metrics to support it. Let's have some ROIs in there. The, the, the one that's, in my, in my experience, the one that's almost the hardest one to get to deliver the cash for you is the CFO. CFOs are always, you know, it's not critical, we don't need to do that, blah, 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 blah. Well, start showing your CFO your ROIs that you have on turnover and attracting good people and development. And all of a sudden, they're going to start to go, oh, okay, we can make more money if we do this, right? So please, it's got to be a strategic role. Do what you can to start thinking strategically. Um, one of the discussions earlier, one of the breakouts, was talking about everybody in the organization needs to think strategically, which I agree with 100%. You know, and, and, and you need to be strategic thinkers. In fact, you might need to be the most value, you are the most valuable, potentially valuable strategic thinkers in your own organizations. So identify two or three things and then create a plan to implement it. You know, for me, if I don't go back and write it down and do something with it right away, a week later I'm like, oh, I haven't done anything with it. And then a month later I'm like, oh, it's gone. You know, so do something with it today or tomorrow. Um, so some final words of wisdom. Um, make talent attraction, retention, and development a strategic priority. And do everything you can in your organization to show how valuable it is financially as a starting point. Build a core competency in talent management and development. It should be a core competency. You're not just a good company because you have a great sales team or because you gr develop great products and have great engineering. Developing talent should be one of those core competencies that you have and that you strive to have and make better all the time. Last one is measure and reward it. The more we measure something, the more we get, right? So the more we can measure talent and the more we can reward it, the more the infrastructure will begin to fall in place. So um, I mentioned before, there's an appendix. And look at those guys. Look at their faces. How could you not want to see that appendix? <laughs> Am I right? So um, it's there, and it's got a bunch of recommendations on um, retention for you. Okay. So with that, questions, thoughts, comments from the group? Yeah. That's awesome. Do you use a third party to do it or do you guys do it yourselves? Okay. That's really good. I love that. I've seen a few companies doing that now and I've seen, you know, just the regular kind of let's let's test the waters with, you know, simple things like survey monkeys and pulse interviews, but I love the stay interviews. That's a good for you. Other comments, other questions? Losing the customers is yeah. my job has to be keeping the customers happy. I just don't have the time. The time. Do you have any recommendations for how to sort of pull out of that yeah. cycle? Yeah. You know, the, the, the downside to that, right, is it can get awful and it can create cultural issues. You can end up losing a bunch of good people. That's a horrible cycle that people get into. And the reality is you need to have that budget. I'd say you got to go in and fight for that budget. So you can, if you need to, get a third-party trainer, you know, to develop some curriculum and some training. So day one, people come in, they spend a week in a, in a knowledge accelerator or a boot camp, and then you release them to the company. Um, and it, it takes the stress off of the first-line management that's out there. 
Um, it's horrible. I remember, you know, being a young a young person and being a supervisor. And for me, it was terrible because if people didn't show up, for example, my day was like ruined. But then if I had brand new people that I had to train, my day was ruined. <laughs> I mean, that's an over-exaggeration, but the reality is you don't get anything else done, right? Um, and then if you're really busy and you're already working 12 hours a day, it's just so frustrating. So you got to get that budget and you put a plan in place. Um, and if you lose, what, I would, what I've seen happen a lot of times is you lose somebody that's really good. And it's like they're so frustrated. Um, use that as the turning point to say, they left and here's why. We need to fix this and here's how we can fix it. We've got to put together a plan to get these people trained before we release them to, um, uh, to, to the production line or whatever it might be. To piggyback that, I, I work with Jim. One of our clients, they had an aging workforce and they were struggling with that exact same issue. What we found is that some of these guys had been doing this for 20, 30 years that were, I don't want to say going through the motions, but they were dangerously close to retirement. They were kind of checked out. Certainly didn't want to take on the additional responsibility of training. When they were viewed as the subject matter experts and they realized that they had all of this institutional knowledge that was important to the organization's growth, what we saw is they became reinvigorated, re-energized, their productivity went up, they became competitive with one another as they were training new hires, and it was just this huge cultural shift. Um, so the people that were the <coughs> biggest naysayers of, I don't have the time to do this, then realized, gosh, this is really fun and exciting, and I remember why I got into this in the first place, and a lot of those people, they want to feel like at the end of their career it was worth it. I logged 20, 30 hours at this company, I gave my blood, sweat, and tears. Part of that is that legacy of what they can pass on to the next generation. But I think it takes a shining example, a bright spot of somebody that starts to do it, and then you'll see others mm -hmm. that, and that's just been our experience. Do, do you guys have some internally trained trainers that, uh, that are the go-to trainers? Yeah. So I think it's, it's identifying maybe some of those mm -hmm. people who are passionate about it, um, but recognizing at the same time they have a time and a full time and maybe a half of a time job to do outside yeah. of that. You know, so That's it's right. sort of creating, I guess, that um, figuring out a way to sort of get it all done while yeah. you still recognize that there's all these open positions at the same time. So. That's it's a conundrum out there. Yeah. That great point. Ah, okay. So they want the next level, but the next level requires maybe manufacturing experience, maybe you know an, a, a spot that we have in a different facility, or globally, maybe moving to Europe, maybe moving to China, and they're not willing to do that. Mm. So this is where we're just you know trying to figure out what we do for a career ladder when that re that's required for the next level, and they don't want to move, and they have plenty of opportunity in this area, as we know. Yeah. Um, you know, some people have manufacturing locally here, and so they can provide that to them, and then they're going to those companies that, that can give them that without having to leave the area. But I would think at some point they can't go any higher, or they would have to have that flexibility. Everybody stops at some level, right? Mm -hmm. So it's inevitable that that's going to happen. Right. Um, sometimes what we've seen is, because that's a fairly common <laughs> issue, especially with larger companies, um, is are, there are other career paths that they could go down that might have more of a local flavor. So you look at those. Now, if they say, I don't like any of those, and I'm not willing to move within this path, then it's like, well, you know. We've switched product lines, so they've gone from maybe pistons to bearings, and so it's a different product line to learn. You know, we've been trying to do that, but when we talk about millennials that every two years want something different, <laughs> I'm thinking in my head, how are we going to do this? You know, over a 30-year career, they want 15 jobs, and I don't have 15 jobs, so they won't leave the area. And yeah. So, you know, that's, that's the struggle that we're facing right now, yeah. is keeping talent and, and giving that career ladder when they're not flexible. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, a, that's an issue that we're all trying to wrestle with, right? Because you want to create the ladders, right, and make, make it clear. But um, it is a dynamic that I think is, to some extent, a little bit of youth, right? We all wanted to, the day we got out of college, we're like, oh, I'm going to be the CEO of General Motors. 
um, the reality is, you know, you, you, the cer certain people are going to leave. I mean, there is a certain level of loss that you're going to have that you're just probably never going to be able to stop. But I always say, try to try to see what else there is. Sometimes um, going through um, the job sculpting sculpting process can be really helpful because you might actually identify, oh, this is an interest of yours, and we think you're pretty good at this. You know, we hadn't talked about this before, but maybe you should be in the talent department, or maybe it's finance, or whatever it might be. So sometimes just that, that fundamental shift in what they're doing can be a really good thing, too, and kind of be like, oh, I'm really enjoying and I'm learning, and maybe take a little, take a little pressure off, um, especially when you have like the A players that you really don't want to lose. That's where you, I think, we tend to try to do um, job sculpting with A players to make sure we're, we really got a handle on it. So these are tough issues, right? There's no silver bullet to any of these. Any other questions, thoughts? Um, in the, uh, the area of the thumb that I work with, uh, with the hiring, I'm seeing a huge growth in um, staffing services that companies are going with. And do you have any data or anything that shows how that affects uh, turnover rates? If companies you know, start with staffing companies or if they do direct hire, so um, two, two elements there. First of all, staffing and contingency labor, the trend is like this. I saw um, one statistic that said that by the year 2025, 50% of the American workforce will be contingent labor, whether, which is crazy to me. It sounds unbelievable, but certainly when you look at the trend, it looks, um, it looks graphically possible. Um, and I have seen some data, I can't quote it, but it's always the turnover levels are higher. Um, people don't feel the commitment from the company um, at that point in time. Um, there's just so many things that direct hires have that somebody coming through a temp agency doesn't have. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not the ideal situation. Yeah, well, you know, I, you might have some good ideas. I've got some thoughts, but you're more of an expert than I am. You got any thoughts on the culture of measurement? Uh, you know, it, it comes down to personality, values, and beliefs, and uh, identifying in your culture um, what's consistent across the company, maybe what's, what's special in different parts of it, and then, then trying to assess accordingly. And doing it both in the, the testing and then the interview. Yeah, and, and we typically, one of the things that's really critical is just making sure you've defined your own culture. You know, what are your core values culturally? So at least you start with that and then you make it part of the interviewing process. And then there are assessments that you can build that are customized to your culture and what specifically, what behaviors you're looking for. And one of the cool things about it is you can actually take people that, are, that you deem as perfect fits culturally and you can assess them and then you can look for those characteristics that you want to try to match. So there are tons of tools out there and folks like John that can actually help you develop a custom tool for yourselves. But um, the first point is make sure you define it. Make sure you define what your culture is and what your core values are. Does that help? Yes, sir. Anything else? I would just add on to that. Make sure it's really true because I think sometimes yes. companies identify their values. They pick the top 10 that they find wherever. This key should be our values, but maybe they are, maybe they yeah. are. Um, I'm curious about whether companies are going to the length of working with universities to try to encourage students to go into the fields where they're having difficulty finding the talent. Yeah, you yeah. hear about engineering IT being the ones that um, where companies can't find enough entry level type people. Have they gone to that length? Is it starting to happen? <laughs> it, it, it's starting to happen only in bits and pieces. Uh, I encourage you to do that. I always encourage my clients to go, whether it be to the local trade school or community college or to the local universities. We were, um, so the answer is they're not doing it enough. Um, we are seeing what, what are called industry partnerships now that are beginning to develop in a lot of the workforce development regions around the country. And that's where they take companies, workforce development, and then educational institutes, and they try to align the needs and the curriculum. So some of that is happening, but not enough. 
we were talking to some folks from IBM, and they're, they're trying to hire every kid they can get out of Michigan State's IT program and one of their IT programs. And they're only putting like 100 kids through the program, and that's it. And it's like, IBM's telling MSU, we need three times that. Can't you expand this program? So, you know, they're, they're trying to figure that out. But universities and community colleges are generally inflexible and slow to move. Um, they may do a great job, right? But they're slow to move to react to what the market needs. We're kind Sandy. Of partnering with um, the local high schools now, and they're doing, um, Michigan Tech is coming down to Schoolcraft College, I believe, in October. And they do all of these experiments with the kids. And so the college students are coming down, and then they bring the local high school kids in with their parents. And so they all kind of come together for the day, and we have a table there, and we talk to them about different opportunities when it comes up. We're catching them sooner before college because we want them as interns and co-ops while they're in college. Mm -hmm. So it's like we've started kind of backing ourselves up now, and we're saying we need engineers. We need people to come in. We need females to get more excited in engineering because it's mainly a, a male-dominant um, background, and I think that we get some creativity added in there when we have more females as part of that. And so we're, um, we're trying to focus on that piece of it as well, but we're trying to do the, the, the actual elementary and, and high school to catch them and get them excited in it before they get to that point, and then, then they know our name by the time they get to college, and then they want to come see us for in jobs. And you, and you guys are ahead of the curve by doing that. Yeah. We have a similar program, Rochester Adams High School is a practical program that we've been doing with their uh, Mendoza's who have a technical interest. We haven't decided yet what they want to be, but they want to try and figure out if this is something they're interested in. We're, uh, you know, we're lucky to have a, a really cool technical lab that we allow them to play around in for 20 hours during the course of, you know, a few weeks uh, after school, and uh, subsequently, you know, they come back for internships. And, you know, it's really cool. Yeah, so. good stuff. I love, I love to hear that because you guys are the exception. There's just not enough of that going on. I know that we're out of time. Thank you.